Welcome everybody to the 52nd edition of Vision du Réel International Film Festival. Bienvenue tout le monde au Festival International du Film Vision du Réel. I'm very glad to be here for a, for a discussion with a film coming from our Burning Light competition. Uh, please welcome Karin Kapsen from Only the Winds. Hello. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, so you are a New Yorker right now, right? Yep, in Manhattan. Okay. Uh, your film is all set in, uh, in Lebanon and it's the story of someone coming back after a long time in his, uh, in his homeland. Uh, it, nevertheless, the film, it's like a constant twist. There are many moments in which we are changing direction and wandering and taking other ways. And can you tell us a little bit how you build this story? Yeah, it's a bit, um, it, it, it starts really with a question um, mm -hmm. of what is consciousness. And when mm -hmm. you think of what is consciousness, you know, you think of directions, where is it going, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There is potential, uh, mm -hmm. some, you know, there's an instinctive pull to go somewhere, but you don't necessarily know where it's going. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to think that I make my films uh, in that way. Um, without a you know, premeditated plan, but sort of with, a, with an idea of where I'm going. And so what were the moments in which, uh, what has been the accidents that finally shaped the film as we see it? Uh, about a decade ago, I was acting in a TV show in Egypt right before the revolution. Oh. And uh, I uh, was forced to go blind actually, because not because of the show, but because I had like one sty on each eye. So they had to remove them mm -hmm. surgically. So they said, we either do that or we send you back home and we replace you. So I said, okay, I'll do it. Fine. So I was blind for about four days. Mm -hmm. um, and I concluded that I had never seen so much before uh, mm -hmm. when I took the patches off. So that kind of instigated some kind of idea, a direction for me, you know, something to, to linger on later in life, which led me to make this film. Um, and it ties back to my first point, you know, what is consciousness? So removing one of your senses doesn't mean that you're going to experience less. It might mean that you Um, might as well experience more. So there is one of the most, uh, the, the, like the core of the film is uh, set in a uh, in a school or an institute uh, in that is uh, taking care and fostering a blind person. Uh, how was for you to shot in this context? Uh, how was for you to like arrive with your eyes and your mechanic eyes and and shoot in this context? Uh, I must say it was uh, extremely difficult to, um, to be there and um, to not impose. Um, so you have to kind of play a little bit with the, with the children, um, be observant, but also uh, chime in sometimes. And uh, that was, I think, the most difficult aspect of the film because it's not under control, you know, The, the school is sort of is kind of unfolding as it is. And, and you have to kind of jump in and jump out um, whenever you feel like um, it was, again, it was very instinctive. I, I had to really rely on my intuition over there. Uh, not so much on, uh, on the way that uh, you traditionally make films and think about films and write. And, you know, so mm. a lot of the writing was happening over there. You know, there was an idea of what we, where we were going Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that, you know, went out the window as, uh, you know, as hybrid films sometimes do <laughs> because of the nature of how everything changes. And I've learned something, you know, in my life um, or I've experienced something rather is that everything is bound to change, um, change directions. So I'm always open to that. And a lot of my previous films, my shorter films also have the same kind of um, uh, direction and concept where, I land in a, in a place to make a film and then something happens and I can't make it anymore. So I have to make about a film about, you know, not being able to make the film anymore. So mm. um, I've gotten kind of used to this improvisation and openness. So, I mean, I arrived to Egypt, you know, and the revolution began and I went to Syria, the revolution began. And then I went to Lebanon um, in August and the explosion happened and I almost, almost got killed. So I ended up making my, my second feature about that. So everything's bound to change. So I'm always open to, to that. And that's how my filmmaking style kind of, um, you know, springs. 
Can you tell me a little bit about Beirut? Because I think that the city is uh, like main mm. character in the town. And uh, in, can you tell me how you related to it and how it was for you to come back to film uh, where you have been growing up? It's a, it's a very emotional journey going back home every time because, you know, my parents lived there and I grew up there. Um, to some degree, I'm, I'm attached to the, the notion of space and, and uh, family, of course, and roots. But I'm also a person that's not very attached in general and very detached uh, emotionally at the same time. So I have this kind of um, <laughs> dissonance, uh, so to say. Um, but, you know, Beirut's a very um, abstract place. To, to experience because it's in the middle of everything you know everyone wants a piece of it and um, there's so much history there you know civilization began uh, in that area so to speak but um, you know I mentioned in the film like you know it's a research playground so mm -hmm. um, I kind of you know I, I disagree with myself it's part of the script but <laughs> everywhere is a research playground and that's what my assistant director responds in the scene to me and I, I try to like weave my way around it just to avoid um, my mistake or, or what I think is false, but uh, she kind of puts me on the spot. And I think that makes me vulnerable and, and I don't mind that on, on screen. Yeah, your assistant director is a very interesting character, right? It gives a lot of uh, dialogue and uh, yeah. in a way she keeps up a lot of issues uh, in the film. Is someone, uh, how did you meet her and what has been your like deal yeah. <laughs> before the scene to, to, to be like this in the film? This, uh, she's a professional actress, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, we met back in college, um, mm. what, eight years ago or so, even more maybe. Um, and uh, the relationship there is kind of vague also. You know, it, it, sometimes it feels romantic, sometimes it feels uh, mm. otherwise, but um, <laughs> there's, there's play on that and it never really gets explored. And I like that, you know, it's just, it's on the surface. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave that for the viewers to, to just explore, but, um, the, the main point is, you know, she was, she was very clouded by the fact that I was not providing her with the script, um, ever. So, and she's used to having scripts. So, you know, we just, we'd flow together and, and, um, I had my certain ways of, of psychologically <laughs> approaching uh, her character. Can we talk a little bit about the editing? Because the film, you talk about uh, a lot about the improvisation, but then uh, all this improvisation, it's uh, like very tied together. It's very, it's linked together very precisely. So I would like to know how you managed to work on the editing, if this was uh, like a, something you were doing since the beginning or if you shoot first and then go to editing room afterwards. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, essentially, I think, uh, I meditate on the whole film prior. I know what it's going to feel like. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like in an editing sequence. Um, but I know when I put something together, it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel like what I've felt when I've meditated or when I've written the script. Same thing for me. Um, so it's, it's hard. You know, it's, it's like a 50-50 situation where... You imagine something and then you go and something else happens. Of course, you have to change. But I'm always constantly editing as I go. Um, and, you know, as long as you stay focused on what you're, um, what you're aiming for, then some, somehow it will feel right at the end. So, yeah, the, the editing ch changed a lot of things, but uh, it didn't really change the essence and nature of the film and what it's trying to say or explore. And it was a long process? compared to the shooting? Uh, no, it was about maybe four months to edit. Uh, oh, okay. We made the film Reasonable. pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the film was, was done for a while. We shot in, like in 2019, right when the revolution, actually Lebanese revolution too, just to add one on top. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's been done for a while, but because of the pandemic, you know, it got pushed to this year. Mm. Um. I would like, you met a, a girl during the film, a little girl, and then you, you like wave with her uh, 
a very uh, a very unique in a way relationship and you she's becoming your main character and you in a way you she go through rough adventure because uh, she, you write for her rough adventures so i would like to know how you met her and how was work with her uh probably the the easiest part was working with her <laughs> <laughs> um she's just very playful and and just wants to act wants to be on screen and um in the film i give her you know my little 35 millimeter camera for her to use and and she's obsessed with taking pictures you know she um it's something we'll never understand you know like how she's imagining that and i think that's that's another question of you know um something to just drop in the box of consciousness <laughs> or in the space um but yeah i mean it's so fascinating working with children firstly uh but um there's again you know there's a there's a sense where you're uh, you're a magnet to someone uh someone's energy and i when i met her it was immediately that like i didn't think twice in a way she she looks to me like a really metaphorical character in a way and uh, what she goes through and it's uh, to me i mean if the, i would i don't want to spoil what's going on in the film but still, I think that the last part of the film is a lot to do with, the, with what Lebanon is living uh, with the country. So I thought it was like, a, yeah, a metaphorical dimension, but also uh, a recalling of, uh, of a reality that I think that you were like rediscovering after, after being away. Absolutely. You know, it's, um, the film doesn't really, uh, it, it it almost lacks a, a narrative thread, you know, because mm -hmm. it does take a different direction at the end with the third part. Um, so that part can essentially be, um, you know, understood uh, in, in any one, you know, it can be interpreted in any, any way possible. Mm -hmm. What's important is that, yes, it's a metaphorical space to uh, ponder on, on the, the state of, of Lebanon. Uh, the state of cinema, the state of being uh, as, a, as a human being, uh, as a living being. So, uh, you know, all these questions get kind of put together at the end uh, and not necessarily answered, but the, the essence is there, the energy is there, you know, the nature of the film kind of takes shape over there. Um, it moves in a very subtle way, you know, it doesn't really try to tell you or give you advice uh, about anything. But um, I think the, the ending of the film can be uh, confusing for people if they're really trying to find the answers and, and find the narrative and the plots, you know, it's not there for them. Mm. <laughs> um, what have been, I mean, this is something that we were talking about, but uh... As I know that uh, your 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 next project is also shot uh, set uh, in uh, in Beirut. Uh, what is it for you to to portray your homeland? What is the relationship that links you to that, and how you feel uh, ease at ease to to film your space and your people? Um, I think it's because I spent so much time there. Uh, again, I'll, I'll come back to the idea of uh, detachment. Um, I'd like to think of myself as a, um, uh, a person that's just floating through the world, uh, through, the, through the universe uh, as an entity. So I feel like, you know, downstairs in, in the, on this block, I can, I can still make a film. You know, I'm still dealing with human beings. Um, I think, however, there's a, a coming down with, to the roots uh, you know, coming of coming from Lebanon and filming there, there's an authenticity that I um, I feel attached to. Not really attached to. I apologize. It's not the right term. Uh, I think more. Um, uh, it it feels more like a place that I can you know make something in now um, because I'm in my early career and it's maybe easier to make films there. Um, but essentially, I can probably make films anywhere. I'm not necessarily attached to a homeland, so to speak. But uh, for now, I think I'm 
focusing on my films back home. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And it, there's nothing wrong with making films uh, abroad either. You know, many filmmakers have done that before. Um, but, you know, sometimes you, you can take the, the tree and plant it elsewhere, but it won't bear the same fruits as uh, Kiaris Tami once said. <laughs> Um, there is a character that is appearing at the very beginning of the film and then is reappearing after a while in the film and is in a way a very dark character. How, uh, um, please tell us something about him because for me it's very enigmatic and still enigmatic even after watching the film twice. Yeah, this, uh, this character is, you know, part of the, I don't want to give away too much, but um, uh, he, he feels like a, um, a person that needs fixing <laughs> or something that needs fixing, right? Um, mm. he's, he's suicidal, obviously. Um, so I, I wouldn't take him too literally. Uh, I would take him more as a metaphor <laughs> uh, of, of the state of uh, what's going on and maybe the state of how I personally feel. Um, at the end of the day, he's just a character, you know, that's... Uh, that's part of the film that I'm trying to make, you know, because there is an interweaving between uh, between the film that I'm trying to make and the film that I'm already making. And and uh, and then there's the improvised part on top of that that makes it a little bit difficult. So I think the film gives away, you know, enough cues um, to, to think about. And um, it, it comes back to a question of, again, uh, you know, metaphysics, you know, what is the nature of our being? Um, do we take consciousness to be fundamental or do we not as we haven't been for the past maybe 400 years uh, with, you know, um, with the successes of science. So I'd like to re, you know, re, um, reintroduce, not reintroduce, but, uh, you know, re-examine uh, consciousness from maybe a more ide idealistic perspective, an idealistic worldview. Um, so um, essentially, this character, yeah, is a, is a, you know, is a metaphor. I wouldn't take him very literally, because we all have that dark side in us, right? It all it exists there. There's good and evil. Um, there's there's always a balance in life. So, I feel like he he really ties down the the narrative and and reminds you that there's something in the back of your back of your obfuscated mind <laughs> that's lingering. Um, that you're not explicitly aware of at the time, but uh, it, it may come up into your uh, self-reflective state and you might think about it and be like, oh my God, like, what, what is this? <laughs> um, and you think about it, you know, you might write about it, you might make a film about it, but that character or that entity is always there in your mind. It, it will never go away. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Karim, for, uh, for those words that I think that has been very enlightening and uh, beautiful to hear. Uh, I would like to remember our audience that the film is available online for 72 hours. And I will also remind our public that lives here around in Switzerland that the film is gonna be shown on a big screen in cinema. Uh, thank you very much, Karim Kassen, and hope to see you soon with your next film in Neon. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. It's a it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.